All right, so hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be starting a new chapter, that's chapter 14 of G and Coley, and the topic here is oscillations. So this is gonna be a fairly long chapter. We'll spend about two weeks on this. And broadly speaking, what we're gonna be talking about in this chapter is systems that oscillate, systems that vibrate or shake back and forth in some way. So to introduce you to this idea, Let's start with a little bit of terminology. So these underlined terms are gonna come up from time to time. So let's start with periodic motion. So periodic motion refers to any type of motion that repeats itself in regular time intervals. So to give you a few examples, we have a swinging pendulum. So a pendulum that swings back and forth is certainly undergoing periodic motion because the motion repeats itself every so often. If we look at the Earth's orbit around the sun, that's a motion that repeats itself every year. So that's periodic. If we look at ripples in the water on the surface of a lake, where we see the water sort of bobbing up and down on the surface of a lake, that's also periodic if it repeats itself in regular time intervals. Or a rocking chair that rocks back and forth. Again, that's periodic motion. So there are a whole lot of different examples you can think of, but the goal of this chapter is gonna to be to understand the mathematics of periodic motion. So to get the mathematical models that describe periodic motion down. And then once we understand these models, we can apply them to any specific example that we encounter. So in other words, all of these different cases that I've outlined here are related to each other mathematically. And throughout the chapter, we're gonna to start to understand that. So another term that's going to come up uh, pretty frequently in this chapter is simple harmonic motion, or SHM for short. This is any periodic motion that can be described using a single sine or cosine function. So it's a little bit more specific than just periodic motion. So of course, when we're talking about SHM, simple harmonic motion, we're talking about something that repeats itself in regular time intervals. But not only that, it can be described by a sine or a cosine function. That's the idea. Um, a simple harmonic oscillator, on the other hand, SHO, is just any system that exhibits this type of motion. So if you have a specific system that undergoes simple harmonic motion, we call that a simple harmonic oscillator, or SHO for short. Okay. So let's take a look at a couple more examples of periodic motion. Now, I'm gonna show you two video clips. The first one is a guitar, and you can see the strings being plucked, and this is what it looks like when we capture the motion with a high-speed camera. So if you focus your attention on any given string, let's say this one over here, right after it gets plucked, the string is basically vibrating up and down. And that motion would be periodic motion because it repeats itself in a regular time interval. Now, if we take a look at the video on the right, this is a video captured of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge back in 1940 when the bridge actually collapsed. And what's happening here is you can see the bridge is kind of twisting uh, back and forth like this so that would be an example, again, of periodic motion because that twisting of the bridge repeats itself in a regular time interval. And what we want to eventually do is understand why this happened. Okay, so why did this bridge fail and then eventually collapse? Because obviously it shouldn't be twisting in this way. So as we get to the end of this lecture, specifically in the last video that we cover in this lecture, we're going to understand why this happened. Okay, but for now, it's just another example of periodic motion because it repeats itself in a regular time interval. If we go to the bottom of the slide here, this is a graph showing periodic motion. So let's say on this axis, we're going to plot the position of some object. And on this axis, we're going to plot time. So this shows periodic motion because the motion repeats itself every so often. But it's not simple harmonic motion because clearly uh, 
the motion is not described by a sine or a cosine function. If we were to smooth out this curve so that it looks like a sine function, then we would be dealing with simple harmonic motion. So we're going to start by taking a look at simple harmonic motion, which is basically the simplest type of periodic motion that we can study, as the name would suggest. And we're going to really try to go into a lot of detail uh, on simple harmonic motion, build up some of the mathematics that describe this type of motion. And then from there, we can look at more complex cases. So remember, simple harmonic motion just means any motion that can be described using sines and cosines. And also remember that a simple harmonic oscillator is just any system that undergoes that type of motion. So let's start by taking a look at some of the basic features of a simple harmonic oscillator. What do they all have in common? Well, the first thing to note is a simple harmonic oscillator or SHO has an equilibrium position, meaning there's some position where the force goes to zero. The next thing is there's a restoring force, uh, which is proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. And then finally, there's no energy loss through friction or air resistance. So let's take a look at a specific example and then see how it meets all three of these criteria. So the example we're gonna look at, and this is kind of our prototypical example of a simple harmonic oscillator, is simply a mass connected to a spring. So we'll have some kind of mass, let's say it's a block resting on a table, and it's connected to a spring. So the mass of the block is M, the spring constant is K, and the surface that it rests on is perfectly frictionless. And then as the block moves back and forth, we'll assume there's no air resistance. So it meets the last criteria. There's no energy loss through friction or air resistance because we're assuming no friction and no air resistance. We can also see that um, we have an equilibrium position and a restoring force because if we take a look at the force that the spring exerts on the block, remember that's gonna be given by Hooke's law. Hooke's law says that the spring force is equal to minus k times x, where k is the spring constant, and x is what we call the deformation of the spring, or how much the spring is being stretched out. The negative sign indicates that the force is a restoring force. It always brings uh, the spring back towards equilibrium. So for example, let's say x equals zero. That's our equilibrium position where the force on the block goes to zero. So then if I stretch the block out, uh, sorry, if I stretch the spring out so that the block is over here now, X has a positive value, but the force according to Hooke's law is negative. So it's going back this way in the negative X direction. That brings it back towards equilibrium. On the other hand, if I were to compress the spring so, the, so that the block is over here, X would be something negative. And so if I look at my equation for the force, I would have a negative sign here, which cancels with the negative sign out front. So the force would be positive, meaning the block would be pushed back this way in the positive X direction. Again, that's back towards equilibrium. This is a restoring force. So the mass spring system that we're uh, taking a look at here meets all of these criteria. It has an equilibrium position, x equals zero. It has a restoring force given by Hooke's law. And since we're assuming no friction and no air resistance, it's not losing any energy as it moves. So that's a simple harmonic oscillator. So if we want to analyze the motion of the block and understand how it moves as it uh, goes back and forth on the table, one way we can do this is to apply Newton's second law to the block. And specifically, we want to do this in the x direction because there's no motion in the y direction. So what we have is the net force, the sum of all the different forces acting in the x direction is equal to m times ax. Okay, when it comes to the left-hand side of this equation, 
there's really only one force to think about, which is the spring force. Remember, we're assuming no friction and no air resistance. So the only force that goes here is the force exerted by the spring on the block. And then when it comes to the right-hand side of this equation, where we have acceleration, remember acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time. So we can make two substitutions here. On the left side, we have minus kx as the only force. And on the right-hand side, we have m times the second derivative of x with respect to time. So if we take that equation and rearrange it a little bit, first by putting minus kx uh, over here, so we're gonna add kx to both sides, so it becomes plus kx over here, and then dividing out the mass, so then we have k divided by m, and then no m here. What we have is the second derivative of x with respect to time plus k over m times x is equal to zero. Okay, so next we'll define a new constant for our equation, which is called the angular frequency. Omega, the angular frequency, is equal to the square root of k divided by m. So just to be clear, this is not something that we derived. This is just a definition that we're going to be using. Omega is the square root of k over m just by definition. And we'll see that it's convenient to define this constant omega in this way as we keep going uh, with this mathematics. Okay, so again, defining omega in this way as the square root of k divided by m, we have k divided by m here. So that would be omega squared. So we have the second derivative of x with respect to time plus omega squared times x is equal to zero. So what we have here is a differential equation for simple harmonic motion, okay? We say this is a differential equation, by the way, because it involves derivatives of x. So we're not simply solving for x and getting a number out. Instead, we're solving for x and getting a function. We're getting x as a function of time out of this equation if we can solve it. And what does this function x of t tell us? Well, basically it tells us exactly where the block is located, what the position x is, at any given time t. So you can plug in a time, and what pops out is the position of the block. So if we can solve this equation, we know the exact motion of the block. We know exactly where it's located at any given time. So if we want to understand how a simple harmonic oscillator moves back and forth, we need to solve this differential equation. In other words, the task in front of us is to consider all the different functions x of t that could satisfy this differential equation which again is the second derivative of x with respect to time, plus this constant omega squared times x is equal to zero. So you don't need to have taken differential equations to know how to do this. We're gonna choose a really simple method for solving this equation, which is called guess and check. So we're gonna guess a solution, and then we're gonna check to see that it works, okay? So let's consider this function x of t is equal to cosine omega t. Does that solve the differential equation? Well, you can figure this out by simply plugging this in and then seeing if it works. So what I want you to do is pause the video, again, test this out, plug it into the equation here, and then see if it works as a solution. Okay, so pause the video, try to work this out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so the function we're considering right now is x of t is equal to cosine omega t. So the first thing I'm going to do here is take a derivative with respect to time of that function. And of course, when we take the derivative of the cosine function, we get minus sine. But I also, by the chain rule, need to take the derivative of what's inside the cosine function. So the derivative of omega t 
with respect to time is just omega, so that factor comes out to the front. If I take another derivative, if I take the second derivative of x with respect to time, well, here's what I get. I have minus omega already out front. If I take the derivative of the sine function, I get cosine. So I have cosine omega t, but just as we did before, I need to take the derivative of what's inside. So the derivative of omega t, again, is omega. So I'm bringing another factor of omega out to the front. So this is now omega squared. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to see, does this solve the differential equation, which says the second derivative of x with respect to time plus omega squared times x is equal to zero. Well, let's plug in what we have. The second derivative of x with respect to time is minus omega squared cosine omega t. And then we add to that omega squared times x. x is cosine omega t. When I add these two things together, I get zero. So it works, right? This actually satisfies the differential equation. So yes, this is a solution. Okay, let's take a look at another potential solution, which is x of t is equal to sine omega t. So just like before, try plugging this into the differential equation that we derived earlier, and then just check to see if it's a valid solution. So again, pause the video, see if you can work this out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so now the function is x of t is equal to sine omega t. And we'll start by taking a derivative of that. The first derivative of x with respect to time. Well, when we take the derivative of the sine function, we get cosine. So we have cosine omega t. But again, by the chain rule, we have to take the derivative of what's inside. So the derivative of omega t just gives you omega. And then if we take another derivative, Okay, we have omega here already. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So now I have negative sine omega t here. And again, I'm gonna pull out a factor of omega to the front by the chain rule. So now this omega becomes omega squared because I have two factors of that out front. So does this solve the differential equation? Second derivative of x with respect to time plus omega squared x equals zero. Well, let's plug in the second derivative. That's minus omega squared sine omega t. And then we have plus omega squared here. That's multiplying x, which is our original function, which is sine omega t. If we add these two together, we get zero which is exactly what we need to solve the differential equation. So yes, this is another solution. So in other words, sine or cosine both work. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the differential equation for simple harmonic oscillators, SHOs, that we derived earlier. So it turns out any simple harmonic oscillator is described by this differential equation. The second derivative of x with respect to time plus omega squared times x is equal to zero. So it doesn't matter if we're talking about the mass on a spring or a different type of simple harmonic oscillator, it's always going to be described by this kind of differential equation at the end of the day. So because that is gonna pop up so many times, let's take a closer look at some of the features. Um, well, this is what we call a second order linear differential equation. Now that's kind of a lot, so let's break that phrase down. We say it's second order 
because it involves the second derivative of the function x, right? We have x and then the second derivative of x over here. So the highest derivative we have is the second derivative. If the highest derivative in the equation were, let's say, the first derivative, then we would call this first order. Okay, we also say it's linear because, well, it's just linear in terms of x and its derivatives. In other words, you just see x here, and you see the second derivative of x here, and those are not being taken to higher powers, like x squared, or we're not squaring this, right? Everything is purely linear. There are no higher power terms like x squared. And we say it's a differential equation because it involves derivatives. So any linear differential equation uh, obeys what we call the superposition property. And here's what that says. So let's say we have x1 and x2, which are both solutions to the differential equation. Then for any two constants, c1 and c2, c1 times x plus c2 times x is also going to be a valid solution, regardless of what those two constants are. In other words, we can combine the two solutions with any two constants out front, and it will still work as a solution. Well, we found already that we have two solutions for this differential equation, which are cosine omega t and sine omega t. So according to the superposition property, we should be able to combine those two to get a general solution, which says x of t is equal to c1 times cosine omega t plus c2 times sine omega t. That should work as a general solution for the motion of a simple harmonic oscillator, just a sum of a cosine term and a sine term. Now, because we're adding sines and cosines together, let's take a closer look at how the sine and the cosine function both work. So first, let's just take a look at a graph, okay? Where we have y versus x. Now, the blue curve is showing us the curve for y is equal to cosine x, and red is showing us the curve for y is equal to sine x. Now, these two curves have the exact same shape. That's the first thing to note. The cosine and the sine curve have the same exact shape. The only difference between them is that one is offset from the other, and we can take a closer look to see by how much. So remember, uh, cosine, when x is equal to zero, is at a maximum. And then it goes to zero when x is equal to pi over two. Then it goes to a minimum when x is equal to pi. Then it goes back to zero when x is equal to three pi over two. And then it goes back to a maximum when x is equal to two pi. And then after that, it just repeats itself. On the other hand, sine, uh, when x is equal to zero, gives you zero. Then it goes to a maximum when x is equal to pi over two. And then it goes to zero when x is equal to pi. Then it goes to a minimum when x is equal to three pi over two. And then it goes back to zero when x is equal to two pi. So in other words, um, they're just offset by pi over two. If I were to shift the cosine curve by pi over two radians this way, then it would exactly line up with the sine curve. So this is an example of something more general, which is we can take any function whatsoever and shift it along the x-axis to the left or to the right if we simply add a constant to x within our function. So if we're taking the example of sine and shifting it over by pi over two radians, the way we could do that is to say sine of x plus pi over two. So in other words, that's the function sine x shifted over by pi over two. Well, we already saw that's equal to cosine of x. So we actually get this nice little trig identity which says sine of x plus pi over two is equal to cosine of x. Now, the takeaway point of this again is that the sine function and the cosine function are not really all that different uh, for our purposes, they're basically the same thing. One is just shifted over on the x-axis, uh, 
compared to the other. Okay, so if we take a look at the general solution for a simple harmonic oscillator, which is x of t is equal to c1 times cosine omega t plus c2 times sine omega t, we'll notice that we have three constants in the equation. We have c1, we have omega, and we also have c2. Now, since we're basically adding a cosine to a sine function, we should realize that we can write this in a more straightforward and simple way because cosine and sine are really the same thing. One is just shifted over compared to the other. So we can express x of t as a pure cosine function with, again, three different constants, which are gonna be the angular frequency omega, the amplitude a, and the phase phi. So omega a and phi, are the three constants we have. And we can write this as x of t is equal to a times cosine omega t plus phi. Again, these are equivalent expressions, but this is a little bit more straightforward because it's just a pure cosine function. So we need three different constants, a, omega, and phi, to describe the simple harmonic motion. Well, if if we're dealing with a mass on a spring, then we already saw that omega squared is equal to k divided by m, the spring constant divided by the mass. But if we're dealing with a different type of system, let's say, you know, a pendulum swinging back and forth as an example, then the formula for omega will be different. But it's still going to be the case that omega appears here in the solution. It's just the formula for omega might be something different depending on the situation. The constants a and phi, on the other hand, are going to depend on the initial conditions. In other words, what was the starting conditions, or what were the starting conditions of our oscillator? In other words, what was the initial position, x at time zero of the oscillator? And what was the initial velocity? How fast was it moving at time zero? We need to know both of these things to actually figure out what a and phi are, and so later on in the lecture, I'll show you an example of how to do that. So to get a little bit more intuition for this solution and what it's telling us, let's take a look at an animation real quick. So in this animation, you're going to see the block uh, as it moves back and forth on the surface. Uh, I'm not showing the spring here, but imagine there's a spring on the left side that connects to the block. And then I'm also going to show the actual solution uh, plotted out on a graph. So on this axis, we have x, which is the position of the block. And on this axis, we have time, which is, well, how much time has elapsed. And again, the general form of this is a cosine omega t plus phi. So it's basically a cosine function. And in this case, we're gonna set phi equal to zero just for simplicity. So it's just gonna be a times cosine omega t uh, and this is the curve that we're going to be following. So this red dot is actually going to trace out where we are specifically on that curve as the animation plays. So let's take a look at that. And let's see it one more time. Okay. So what's happening is at t equals zero, x is equal to a, positive a. And then the block gets pulled this way where it reaches x equals zero, that's the equilibrium position. But then it overshoots that position and now uh, it reaches x equals minus a and then goes back to x equals zero, which is over here and then it goes back to x equals positive a, which is over here. And then after that, it repeats itself. So again, this is an example of periodic motion because the motion just repeats itself over and over again. So a is what we call the amplitude. That would be the maximum displacement from equilibrium that the block reaches, right? It never goes further than the amplitude. So the next thing I want to do here 
to show you what happens when we change the values of a, omega, and phi, so you get some more intuition for what those constants mean. So in the first graph up here, I have position x versus time t on this axis. And what I'm gonna do is pull the slider to the right, and as I do that, I'm increasing the amplitude. So notice what happens when I increase the amplitude. I'm basically stretching the graph vertically. In other words, I'm increasing the maximum position of the oscillator. I'm increasing how large the oscillations are. Okay, that's what happens when I increase the amplitude. If I decrease it and go back this way, I'm making the oscillation smaller. So the maximum position is getting smaller and smaller as I go this way. That's what changing the amplitude does. Now over here, let's see what happens when I change omega. The angular frequency omega is what's gonna change now when I uh, pull the slider to the right. And now notice what's happening. Um, I'm not stretching the graph uh, vertically, I'm actually compressing it horizontally. So as I'm increasing omega, in other words, I'm increasing the speed of the oscillations. They're happening faster and faster as I increase omega. And if I decrease omega by pulling the slider back this way, then the oscillations are happening slower now. So in the same amount of time, I'm getting fewer oscillations. So that's really what omega does. It determines how fast the oscillations are. The larger omega is, the faster the oscillations will be. And finally, if we go down here and change the phase angle phi, well, this is what happens when we do that. So I'm not really stretching or compressing the graph in any particular direction. Instead, as I change phi, what I'm doing is shifting the graph along the time axis. So in other words, by changing the value of phi, I can shift the graph along the time axis, and I can change what the starting position is going to be. So here, at this value of phi, the starting position is x equals 1, because that's the value of x. Uh, at time zero, but I shifted over a little bit and now the starting position is x equals zero So basically by choosing the right value of phi I can shift the graph along the time axis To match whatever starting position I want for the particular situation. I'm dealing with okay, so that's what phi does Okay, so when it comes to how fast a system is oscillating We can measure this in a few different ways and in particular, I want to look at frequency and period. So the frequency F is the number of full cycles completed per unit time. So if we're thinking about the mass on a spring, let's say, how many times does it oscillate back and forth in a certain amount of time, usually per second? So we typically measure this again in hertz, where one hertz is equivalent to one inverse second. That's the uh, SI unit for frequency. We can also measure how fast a system is oscillating as an angular frequency omega. And the only difference between F and omega is that now we're measuring things in radians per second as opposed to full cycles per second. So the only difference between omega and F is a factor of 2 pi, where omega is equal to 2 pi times F. Okay, now we already have a formula for omega. Remember, for a mass spring system at least, omega is equal to the square root of k divided by m, where k is the spring constant and m is the mass. So notice that this frequency, the speed of the oscillations, does not depend on the amplitude of the motion. Okay, the only thing it depends on, again, is k and m. So keep that in the back of your mind for what comes next. And then finally, the period, uh, capital T, is just the time it takes to complete one full cycle. So usually we measure the time it takes to complete one full cycle in seconds. So remember, the, the higher the frequency, the faster the oscillations are happening, which means the smaller the period will be. It will take less time to complete one oscillation. So period and frequency 
T and F are inversely related to one another. In fact, T is just equal to 1 divided by F. And if we do a little bit of algebra, we can see that T is equal to 2 pi divided by omega. So let's real quick derive some of these results and uh, see where they came from. Okay, so first let's remember that frequency is the number of cycles per unit time, let's say seconds, um, that our system undergoes. Now, if we want to turn this into omega, radians per second, we just need to convert from cycles to radians. So every one cycle of oscillation is equivalent to two pi radians. So we can cancel those units here. And now we have radians per second. How did we get there? Just with this factor of two pi. And again, when we measure this in radians per second, what we have is omega. So the lesson here is omega is just equal to two pi times f. That's where that came from. So let's also compare um, f, which again is the number of cycles we complete every second. And let's compare t, the period, which is the number of seconds that it takes to complete one cycle. Well, it should be pretty clear that one is just the inverse of the other. So in other words, t, the period, is equal to one over f. But just a second ago, we came up with this nice relationship between omega and f. In other words, f is equal to omega divided by two pi, according to the previous result. So this is the same as one over omega divided by two pi or two pi divided by omega. That's one way we can talk about the period of oscillation. Okay, so let's take a look at this conceptual example. So suppose we have two identical mass spring systems. So we have system A with mass M and spring constant K, and we have system B with the same exact mass and the same exact spring constant over here. You compress system A 12 centimeters from equilibrium, and then you compress system B 25 centimeters from equilibrium. Then you simultaneously release both systems, which sets them in simple harmonic motion. The question here is, which one will return to its starting position first? Is it gonna be system A, system B, or is it they return to their starting positions at the same exact time? So pause the video, think about this for a second, and then come back to it when you think you have your answer. Okay, let's work this out. What we're really concerned with here is the period of the oscillation, right? Because the amount of time it takes for the system to go back to the starting position is the time it takes to complete one cycle. That's called the period. And as we saw, the period is given by 2 pi over omega. In other words, it's 2 pi divided by the square root of k over m, which again is the formula for omega when we're dealing with a mass spring system. So to write this in a more uh, visually pleasing way, we have 2 pi times the square root of m over k. Now here's the thing about these two systems. The mass of block A is the same as the mass of block B. The spring constant for system A is the same as the spring constant uh, for B. So immediately we should be concluding that TA and TB are the same. In other words, they have the same period, which means they return to the starting positions, 
at the same exact time. And the idea that I'm really trying to get across here is that even though the amplitude for system B was bigger than the amplitude for system A, okay, so B had a bigger amplitude, that doesn't matter. This doesn't affect the period of the motion. Okay, so let's do another example. This one we'll do some calculations with. We have a block of mass M equals 125 grams connected to a spring with a force constant K equals 23.5 newtons per meter as shown below. The block is given a push, which sets it in motion. What is the angular frequency omega of the block's oscillation in radians per second? What is the frequency F in Hertz? And what is the period T in seconds? So pause the video, try to do these calculations, see what you get, and then come back to the video to compare with my answers. Okay. So how about we start with the angular frequency, which is omega. Omega is the square root of K over M if we're dealing with a mass spring system. So we have the square root of K, which is 23.5. A newtons per meter is the uh, unit for the spring constant, but remember, this is equivalent to a kilogram per second squared. So I'm gonna write it as a kilogram per second squared. And then divide by the mass, which is uh, 125 grams or 0.125 kilograms. We need those mass units to cancel out. Okay, so when we square root this, we get seconds on the bottom. And this is actually measured in radians per second. So what we have is 13.71 radians per second. Keep three uh, sig figs, 13.7 radians per second. That's omega. Okay, well, remember, if we just want the frequency, then remember that omega is equal to 2 pi times f. So f is omega divided by 2 pi. This is going to be 13.71 radians per second divided by 2 pi. Now, implicitly, 2 pi is measured in radians. So we can see that in the end, we're just left with inverse seconds, 1 over seconds as the unit. And um, this becomes 2.182 inverse seconds or rounding to three sig figs, 2.18 hertz. Again, just remember that um, hertz and inverse seconds are the same thing. Okay, finally, we can get the period of the motion, which is how long it takes to oscillate back and forth for one complete cycle. And we'll just remember that T is equal to one divided by F. So we have one divided by 2.182 inverse seconds. <clears throat> that just actually is seconds on top. And if you crunch the numbers, you get 0.4583 inverse seconds three sig figs, that's 0.458, uh, sorry, seconds. Yeah, 0.458 seconds is the period. Okay, so that's how you do these. Okay, so let's do another example. Um, so suppose we have two identical mass spring systems, just like before, system A and system B. 
have the same exact value of M and the same exact value of K. We're gonna compress system A, 12 centimeters from equilibrium, and we're gonna compress uh, system B, 25 centimeters from equilibrium, and then at the same time, let them both go so that they're in simple harmonic motion. So the question here is, which one has the largest maximum speed? So we can imagine that the block of each system has a certain speed, which might be changing throughout the motion, but of course there's a maximum speed that it achieves at some point. Which one of them has the largest maximum speed? Is it system A, system B, or is it they have the same maximum speed? So pause the video, try to work this out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so from before, we saw that the period for system A and system B are the same. So they take the same time to complete one cycle. On the other hand, they're not moving the same distance. System B has to travel a greater distance to complete the cycle. So in other words, distance A is less than distance B. So remember that speed is just distance over time. If the time is the same for both systems, but the distance is greater for system B, then we should conclude that the speed for system B is greater than the speed for system A. In other words, B has a greater maximum speed. That's what we should expect. Okay, but let's try to make a more rigorous argument for this. Let's remember that velocity is dx dt. We can think of it as the first derivative of position with respect to time. And we can also remember that a derivative is the same as a slope on a graph. In particular, the velocity would be the slope of the x versus t graph for each oscillator. So if we take a look at system A, this would be the x versus t graph. So x is gonna be up here. And let's mark off 12 centimeters because that's where we start. And then at some point we reach negative 12 centimeters down here. So basically what's happening is for system A, we start at 12 centimeters, you go to minus 12 centimeters, back to 12, and just oscillate back and forth like this. But notice that the maximum speed that we reach, try to draw that a little bit better. Okay, the maximum speed that we reach is where the slope of this graph is the largest. So this slope here that I'm drawing would be V max for system A. Now, if we draw the same type of graph, but for system B, where this time we start at x equals 25 centimeters and we reach a minimum of minus 25 centimeters, but the oscillations are happening just as fast. In other words, the period is the same. This graph would just be a stretched out version of the other graph. So the maximum speed would be the slope over here, the biggest slope that we see, which is clearly a bigger slope than before 
Okay? So in other words, when we increase the amplitude, we also increase the maximum speed or the largest slope on the x versus t graph. So again, we reach the same conclusion that v max for system B is bigger than v max for system A. So when it comes to a simple harmonic oscillator, what we found so far is a general solution for x as a function of time. In other words, for position as a function of time. So the next step is to find the velocity function. So what is the velocity as a function of time of our simple harmonic oscillator? So all we have to do to find this is remember that velocity is the first derivative of position with respect to time. In other words, uh, Vx as a function of time is just dx dt where before we found that x is equal to a times cosine omega t plus phi. So we're taking the derivative with respect to time of this function. Okay, the first thing we can do when we evaluate this derivative is to pull out the constant a, and then we have a times the derivative with respect to time of cosine omega t plus phi. So if we're going to evaluate this derivative, we're going to have to use the chain rule, which says first we take the derivative of cosine, which gives us negative sine. So I'm going to have minus a times sine omega t plus phi. But then I'm going to have to take the derivative of what's inside of the cosine function. So I have the derivative with respect to time of omega t plus phi. Now keep in mind that omega and phi are just constants. So the derivative of this thing is just omega. In other words, this pulls out a factor of omega to the front, where we have minus a times omega sine omega t plus phi. So that is the velocity as a function of time of a simple harmonic oscillator. And again, we got here just by taking the derivative of the position function. So that's how this works. And then we can take this a step further by taking another derivative to get acceleration. In other words, we can get a function that gives us the acceleration of our simple harmonic oscillator uh, as a function of time. So remember that acceleration is the first derivative of velocity, or we can think of it as the second derivative of position with respect to time. For this derivation, let's think of it as the first derivative of velocity. So we have ax as a function of time is equal to dvx by dt, where again, the thing we're taking the derivative of is the function we just found earlier, minus a times omega sine omega t plus phi. That's our velocity, and we're taking a derivative of that function. So... Like before, we can pull out the constants, which are a and omega, and the negative sign that comes along with that. Then we have the derivative with respect to time of sine omega t plus phi. And just like before, in order to evaluate that derivative, we're gonna have to apply the chain rule. So when I take the derivative of the sine function, what I get is cosine. So I have the same constants out front, minus a omega, then sine becomes cosine omega t plus phi. But then I have to take the derivative of what's inside of the sine function. So the derivative with respect to time of omega t plus phi. Again, omega and phi are both constants. So when I take the derivative of phi, I get zero. When I take the derivative of omega t, I just get omega. In other words, there's a factor of omega coming out to the front. So now I have minus a times omega squared times cosine omega t plus phi. That's the solution for our acceleration as a function of time for a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, it's minus a times omega squared times cosine omega t plus phi. So let's take a look at all of these functions we solved for, position, velocity, and acceleration.
where when it comes to position, we have x of t equals a times cosine omega t plus phi. For velocity, we have v is minus a times omega sine omega t plus phi. And for acceleration, we have a equals minus a times omega squared cosine omega t plus phi. Okay, so we, we have cosines and sines multiplying some constants out front. That's basically what's happening in each one of these functions. And we'll also remember that the range of the sine or the cosine function is minus one to one. So the smallest value is minus one, the largest is one. And what that tells us is the constant out front of the cosine or the sine function is the maximum value. So if we look at the first one where the constant out front is just a, that's telling us that the maximum value of x, the maximum position, is a, okay? That's really the definition of amplitude, if you remember. a is the maximum displacement from equilibrium. But if we take a look at the next one, the constant out front is a times omega. So that's v max. That's the maximum speed of the oscillator as it goes back and forth. And then if we look at acceleration, we have um, a times omega squared is our maximum acceleration. Okay, so it's these constants out in front of cosine and sine, which gives us the maximum value of each one of those functions. So to put that idea to use, let's do an example. We have a 425 gram block connected to a spring with a force constant of 395 newtons per meter. The block is free to slide on a flat surface with no friction or air resistance. You compress the system uh, 17.5 centimeters from equilibrium and then let it go, setting it in simple harmonic motion. What is the maximum speed of the block in meters per second? Uh, what is the amplitude of the motion in meters? And then finally, what is the maximum acceleration of the block in meters per second squared? Again, you're getting the amplitude, you're getting the maximum speed, and you're getting the maximum acceleration. So pause the video, try to work this out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so the amplitude, remember this is the maximum displacement from equilibrium. where equilibrium is x equals zero. Well, this is something we're just given in the problem. Remember, you can press the spring by 17.5 centimeters and then let it go. So 17.5 centimeters is that maximum displacement or 0.175 meters. Okay, for the maximum speed, We're going to use the result that v max is equal to a times omega. In other words, it's going to be a times the square root of k over m. So omega is the square root of k over m. And so we have a 0.175 meters multiplying the square root of k, which is 395 newtons per meter or we can write this as kilograms per second squared, divided by m, which is 425 grams, or 0.425 kilograms. And if you crunch these numbers, you're going to get 5.335 meters per second, which rounds to 5.34 meters per second. So that's the maximum speed the block achieves in its motion going back and forth. Now for the maximum acceleration, again, we're gonna use the result, A max is equal to A, that's the uh, capital A, the amplitude, times omega squared, which would be A times the square root of K over M squared, which is just K over M. 
So we have 0.175 meters for the amplitude, multiplying K, 395 kilograms per second squared over M, which is 0.425 kilograms, which comes out to 162.6 meters per second squared or 163 rounded to three sig figs meters per second squared. Okay, so next I'd like to plot out the position, velocity, and acceleration functions that we found earlier and look at all of those side by side and see if we can get any additional insight by doing that. So we'll start with x, the position of our oscillator as a function of time is given by a cosine omega t plus phi. So this is a cosine function. It oscillates up and down like this, and its maximum value is a, and its minimum value is minus a. By the way, we're plotting x position on the vertical axis in time t on the horizontal axis like this. A couple things to note, when x is equal to zero, Okay, that would be this point here, or this point here, or any of the points where x is equal to zero. We call that an equilibrium point because the system is at the equilibrium position, x equals zero. When x is at a maximum or a minimum, so plus a or minus a, we call that a turning point because the block is turning around at that moment. See, the velocity is negative going towards that turning point, and then the velocity switches to positive, moving away from that turning point. So this is where the block reverses its direction. That's why we call it a turning point. Okay, now if we plot out the velocity versus time, this is the curve we get using the function we derived. And if we plot out the acceleration versus time, that's the graph on the bottom, this is the curve we get using this function that we derived. So notice that if we look at an equilibrium position, x equals zero, and we kind of go down to the velocity graph, we'll see that the velocity is actually at a maximum or a minimum. Okay, so here's one equilibrium point. Follow that down to the velocity graph. We're at a minimum here, but if we look at, let's say, this equilibrium point, we're at a maximum. So the point is when we're at an ex, uh, when we're at an equilibrium position, uh, velocity is plus or minus v max. And then if we follow this down to the acceleration graph, we see that acceleration is equal to zero. So when x is equal to zero, a is also equal to zero. Then let's take a look at the turning points. Again, this is where position is plus or minus a. If we follow this down to the velocity graph, we'll see the velocity is at zero, which makes sense if you think about it, because if we're turning around here, the velocity has to momentarily go to zero. And if we follow this down to the acceleration graph, we'll see that acceleration is either at a maximum or a minimum. So at these turning points, the points where the, uh, where the block reverses its direction of motion, Velocity is equal to zero, but acceleration is at a maximum or a minimum, so plus or minus a max. Okay, so with all that said, let's do one more example in this video where we apply initial conditions to find x of t. So here's what's going on in this problem. We have a block whose mass is 2.43 kilograms, connected to a spring with a force constant of 221 newtons per meter. The block slides along a frictionless table back and forth like this. At t equals zero, the displacement of the block is 0 0.0624 meters, and the velocity of the block is 0.847 meters per second. What we're gonna do is use all of this information to find the function x of t based on this general form. So in other words, the general solution, of course, is a cosine omega t plus phi. 
what we're going to do in this problem is come up with specific values for a, omega, and phi, and that's how we can find the solution for this specific example. Okay, so we'll remember that the general solution is given by x of t, a cosine omega t plus phi. We need to find three constants, which are a, omega, and phi, and then we'll be done. The first constant we'll solve for is the angular frequency. This is pretty straightforward because omega has a ready-made equation that we can just plug the numbers into. Omega is the square root of k divided by m for a mass on a spring. So when we plug in the values, we have 221 newtons per meter for k. And a newton per meter is a kilogram per second squared, so I'll write it that way. And then we're dividing by m, which is 2.43 kilograms. So if you work this out, it comes out to 9.537 units are radians per second on that. But we'll want to round that to a nice 9.54 radians per second. Okay, so next we're going to find the phase angle. That's phi. And here's how we're going to do this. We're going to take the general solution, x of t is equal to a times cosine omega t plus phi, and then we're going to plug in zero for the time. So in other words, t is equal to zero, so we have x at time zero equals a times cosine. If I plug in zero for the time, omega t is going to be zero, and I will just have phi, and that's it. Okay, next, let's write down the velocity function. Remember, that's just minus a times omega times sine omega t plus phi. So again, we're going to plug in um, t equals 0 into that function. So we have vx at time 0 equals minus a times omega sine omega t goes to 0. So we just have phi left over inside of that function. And if we take the ratio vx at time 0 divided by x at time 0, let's just see what we get. We get minus a times omega sine of phi on top, and then we get a times cosine phi on the bottom, just using the two results from before. And notice how a goes away. So we don't need to know the amplitude for what follows. Also, we have minus omega, sine over cosine is tangent. So this is useful because we don't have two different uh, trig functions. We just have one if we combine them into the tangent function. So therefore, tangent of the angle we're trying to solve for, tangent of phi, is going to equal well, minus um, vx at time 0 divided by omega times x at time 0, if you just solve for it. By the way, um, vx at time 0 is the initial velocity. And we're given this. It's positive 0.847 meters per second. X at time zero is what we call the initial position. And we're given that as well. That's positive uh, 0 0.0624 meters. Okay. 
and omega we just found, so we can plug that in also. So tangent phi is equal to minus, okay, uh, we have 0.847 meters per second for the initial velocity on top. Then on the bottom we have omega, 9.537 radians per second. And then we have x at time zero, which is positive 0 0.0624 meters. That's the initial position. So this is just a number. Tangent phi is equal to some number. And if you compute it, it's minus 1.423. But we'll keep three sig figs on that. Okay, so it looks like our work is basically done because I just need to find phi. So I should just take the inverse tangent of minus 1.423, and that should give me the answer. So if you actually plug this into your calculator, inverse tangent of minus 1.423, it will spit out minus 55.07 degrees. So that's the result that any calculator will give you. Okay, so unfortunately, the situation is a little bit more complicated. It turns out there is one other possible solution to this. And the way we can understand this is by going to the unit circle. On the unit circle, tangent of an angle is equal to the y-coordinate divided by the x-coordinate. Let's draw the unit circle. We have an x and a y-axis. And then this circle with the center of it at the origin like this. So basically, your calculator said the angle that we're looking for is minus 55.07 degrees. Meaning, if we go minus 55.07 degrees below the x-axis like this, then we'll be at this point on the unit circle, xy, where tangent, or sorry, where um, y over x, that ratio, is equal to minus 1.423, okay? But there's another point on the unit circle that will work. It's actually over here. At this point, where the coordinates just have a negative sign relative to the first point. So this would be minus x minus y. And again, on this point, at this point on the unit circle where minus y over minus x is the ratio we're talking about, well, that's the same as y over x, right? These negative signs cancel. So same value of tangent phi at this point on the unit circle. So what's that other angle that could possibly work? Well, it's basically 180 minus 55.07 degrees, which gives us 124.93 degrees, which is this angle right here. And your calculator basically just doesn't tell you that this is also a possible answer. Okay, so to recap, okay, we have tangent phi is equal to minus 1.423. We have two possible solutions. Which is phi equals minus 55.07 degrees. And phi equals 124.93 degrees. We have to basically just figure out which one of those is correct. Now here's how we're going to do that. We know that x when t is equal to 0 is equal to a 
times cosine phi. And we also know that this should be positive. Okay, because going back here, x at t equals zero, the initial position is something positive. So if we choose phi equals minus 55.07 degrees, okay, if you take the cosine of that angle, um, you're gonna get something positive, which means x at time zero is gonna be something positive going to be a positive number. On the other hand, if you use the other possible angle, phi is 124.93 degrees, okay, if you plug cosine of 124.93 degrees in, you get something negative. Well, basically, that is not going to work because x at time zero has to be positive, this does work. Okay, so we have these two possible angles, but we tested them out, and we found that this one is the correct one. So, let's convert that to radians. If phi equals minus 55.07 degrees, then in radians, that's going to be, we have 2 pi radians for every 360 degrees, so that's our conversion factor. And this would come out to minus 0.9611 radians, or to three sig figs, 0.961 radians. So that's the correct phase angle. Okay, so lastly, we can find the amplitude because x at time zero is equal to a times cosine phi. Now that we know the correct value of phi, we can find a, because a is equal to x at time zero divided by cosine phi, which would be, we have x at time zero, 0 0.0624 meters. That's our initial position divided by cosine of phi, which we now know is minus 55.07 degrees. If you calculate that, you're going to get 0.10898 meters, which will round to three sig figs as 0 0.109 meters. So we have all of the different constants that go into the function. So the function is x of t is equal to a, which is 0 0.109 meters, times cosine omega, which is 9.54 radians per second, times t, minus 0.961 radians. Okay, that's the, the solution. for this specific oscillator. So what can you do with this solution? Well, basically, if you plug any value of t into here, you're gonna get out x. You're gonna get the location or the position of the oscillator at that time. So this is an exact description of how the oscillator is moving over time. Okay, so that's what this is going to be used for. So that's going to be it for this video. Um, we're going to continue on uh, talking more about simple harmonic motion in the next video. So I'll see you then. But until then, take care. Be safe, be healthy out there. See you later.